Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome, and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us tonight on uh, the webinar uh, on how to build your chiropractic practice using uh, table talk systems. For those of you who I haven't had the privilege of meeting, my name is Dr. Tom Preston, and it's as I said earlier, it's an honor to have you with us. Uh, I look forward to sharing this information with you. Um, table talk is definitely one of the most least utilized of the education systems in a chiropractic practice, and yet I think it's the one that is literally the glue that holds the rest of the systems together. So uh, I'm looking forward to spending uh, the time with you tonight, um, and uh, thank you for being here. So uh, without too much further ado, let's get into our discussion tonight on the value of table talk. So the question I have for you, and certainly whether you listen to this live or recorded, I want you to kind of just follow along and see if this fits for you. So I want to make sure that you're going to invest your time wisely. So the question I have for you is how many of you feel like you work harder than you need to for the level of monetary results that you get? It's a very common question. And most commonly what I hear back from clients is that, I, yeah, I think I work too hard relative to the level of monetary results that I get. Or maybe others of you on the call that are commonly tired at the end of a day or week and feel there must be a more efficient and effective way to run your practice. And if that's true for you, then you're definitely uh, investing your time wisely. That was certainly true for me. I want to tell you a little bit about uh, my story and how I, I got to be where I am today. As the graphic or the slide so adequately shows, I was a fairly confused young graduate of uh, chiropractic school uh, 20, uh, almost 28 years ago. And I, I really, as probably most of you um, would agree, you didn't really get uh, formal business training or leadership training or any skills training on that front from you know the chiropractic college that you attended. I presently uh, have sat on advisory council at Life University for many years. Uh, go down um, several times a year in order to to lecture to the students to try and help change that to give them more leadership skills and practice management skills and business training and stuff uh, while they're in school. But my experience tells me, 18 years as a professional coach consultant out of thousands of chiropractors that uh, it's not a common experience. I don't care what school you went to. So because I was uh, interested in business, because I really feel business is about people, had a, a few innate skill sets, um, you know, I really felt like there was probably something there. But like a lot of you, I just ran my business on, you know, energy and possibly a little bit of crap. Not knowing what I should be doing, I basically thought, you know, I'll just do what I was trained to do, which is to work really long and hard. I grew up in a rural hobby farm. And, uh, you know, what I learned on the farm was to, you know, how to work on a tractor for 14 hours a day, or how to bale hay or, uh, you know, work in the, uh, the, the oat bins in the, uh, when it was harvest time for, you know, 12 and 16 hour days. So I'm no stranger to hard work. I'm not afraid of hard work and there's nothing wrong with hard work. Um, but there's a consequence to that, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So my office hours, when I started two practices simultaneously from scratch, were to work from eight in the morning to late at night and a half day on Saturdays. So uh, I have not ever advised any of my clients to do that. <laughs> and unless you would be really pumped by that idea, I would highly recommend that you don't do that either. Uh, the only, the wisest thing I ever did was within six weeks of uh, starting out practice that way, I ditched Saturdays and have never worked Saturdays since. Uh, that's my ideal, doesn't necessarily have to be yours. The point I'm trying to illustrate folks was this, was that, it was just pure energy and enthusiasm that got me to be a relative, I'll put that in italic, success in my practice. And we, I, I built that business with a couple of part-time staff, you know, into seeing 250, 300 patient visits a week. I'm not so big about numbers. I want to be clear about that, folks. I've coached people that see 1,500 a week. I've coached people that see 50 or 60 a week. And no one or the other is more or less a success to me. It's all about, you know, doing it your way and, the, and defining success in your ideal. But for me, because I didn't have that definition, I just worked long and hard. And, uh, you know, people started to and, and be served by me. When I started to feel a little tired at the end of a week, when I started to think that maybe uh, we were going to start a family and I didn't want to be that absent dad who never saw his kids, I realized that there must be, or likely, hopefully, was a better, different way. And so I started to invest my time and energy into reading more books about the business and systems. I invested time and money in some great seminars and some great coaches and mentors and guides. And as a result of that, I started to build systems and structure into my business, uh, of which I'm going to share with you some of those tonight. And as a result of those systems and structure, 
uh, with less effort, not more. We basically doubled our services to five, 600 patient visits a week with a couple of part-time staff. We went from two offices to one and uh, became much, much, much more profitable in the process. So um, I, I hope to share with you the consciousness behind that because that's really the start to this whole process of systems, why you should systemize your practice. Uh, if you came here looking for my top 10 table talk ideas, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I would rather you find your own favorite 10, but the consciousness and the structure and how to do that is what I wanna share with you tonight. And if that's worthy of your time and energy, then I'm more than happy to uh, share the time with you. The acronym for systems that I really like, folks, is saving you significant time, energy, and money. And that's really what systems are designed to do. They're really designed to, uh, as I said, using my example, we doubled our services, we doubled our collections, we cut our overhead, and we were doing it with less energy and with more efficiency. And actually, in, based upon the surveys we were doing at the time, we we're actually providing a higher level of service. So please don't think for a second that systems are going to um, you know, make you less human. They're gonna take away the personal touch. In fact, I find the exact opposite is true after 18 years now at Coach Consulting, is that uh, every person I've ever interacted with to date, the worst critic they have is themselves. So in other words, the hardest person on Tom is Tom. And I'm gonna bet that the hardest person on you is you. And so there's a little inner critic in the back of your voice. It's always chirping at you. And you know, for me, it used to chirp at me and wonder whether I spent enough time with the kids and the family or whether I had enough time for my sports and, and other things or whether I was you know, serving my patients enough. And I literally lived in purgatory for a period of time because I wasn't really present with anybody, you know, regardless of what I was doing. Systems allow you to minimize that, that little voice in the back of your head who's chirping at you all the time of whether you're here or there or doing enough or not doing enough. And to the degree that you can quiet that little chirpy inner critic in the back of your voice, back of your head, is to the degree that you can be more present time conscious. And I don't care whether you're talking about spending time with your children, your family, and your church, your synagogue, or whether you're with a practice member, being present time conscious conscious is definitely one of the keys to being a success in life and systems allow that to happen so i hope if you uh, get nothing else out of tonight you will at least entertain the possibility or hopefully i can enroll you in the idea of becoming more systemized and more structured in your business because the counterintuitive thing it gives you more freedom most people think if they get more structured they lose freedom in fact the exact opposite happens you actually get more freedom because you get more done in less time you get better results and isn't that one of the things we want, folks, is to get better results for the people that trust us, uh, you know, with their health care. So uh, this is actually a testimonial that one of my clients from Alberta uh, sent me that he already systemized his business. And again, just phenomenal changes in his, in his life. He grew his practice to a higher level. He made an extra 100K his first year in coaching with us. He had more gratitude for his life. I mean, it just, there was just so much more freedom in his life as a result of getting that uh, piece of the puzzle looked after. So these are the things we want you to get out of our time together tonight. There's seven things I want you to take away from our time together tonight. Uh, number one is, we talked a little bit about it already, is cementing in the value of shifting your mindset to systemizing your practice, uh, ensuring that, uh, you know, they get it and do what you do. And I mean, I can't hear that all the time at seminars, you know, geez, doc, do you know how to help them get it, right? Well, I'll tell you how to do that. How to feel good and walk 25 feet tall when a practice member leaves your practice. Not when you get a new one, when they actually leave. And I'll tell you my Ray Lamb story that actually changed my, my life and changed my practice. I also want you to get the benefit of making education your practice a journey versus a destination. Because too commonly, as I consult around this profession, it's seen as a destination. It's done sporadically instead of written. Really. I also want you to value... Uh, structured table talk. I know there's a lot of people maybe on this call or listening to this call who do table talk, but it's not structured. And there's a big difference between doing it in a structured way and doing it sporadically. I also want uh, you to get how to turn an educational opportunity into a referral moment so your practice members are excited to refer people to your practice. And uh, last but not least, I want you to learn how to ensure you never forget to use table talk to educate again. Because I've talked to so many docs when they coach, consult, and speak around the world. And they tell me, yeah, you know what, Coach Tom, I, I love table talk. It's a cool idea. We used to do that. And it's like, what, what do you mean you used to do that? Well, yeah, we kind of drifted away from it. And I said, well, why did you drift away from it? Well, I'm not really sure why we did that. And it's like, 
I've got a structure uh, and a tool to ensure that that never happens again for you. So again, those are the things we want you to get out of tonight. And without too much further ado, let's dive into that first one. I want you to submit in the value of shifting your mindset to systemizing your practice, all right? So BJ Palmer, the developer of chiropractic, talked about the rugged individualists in italics that literally we stand on the shoulders of at this stage of chiropractic uh, development. Um, they literally were the keys to the profession, you know, growing as it went through those very early years where it was looking for acceptance, it was being challenged. Uh, people were going to jail for chiropractic. People were uh, literally doing everything they could to try and grow the profession. And it took a really rugged individualist. The cool thing about rugged individualists is that they tend to make great entrepreneurs because they're, you know, they're, they're willing to take on that underdog mentality. They're willing to do what it takes to push, to struggle if they need to, to, you know, so go the extra mile to do what it takes to get them where they, you know, where, where they feel like they need to go. Again, we're not having a moral discussion, but relative to the sharp side of the sword to being a rugged individualist is if you take it to extremes, then literally you can get into this scenario. Okay. And yes, you can have a good giggle. This is none other than coach Tom in his Superman outfit. Uh, and as one of my coaches and friends and mentors, Rick Sapio out of Dallas called it, he said, dude, you've got Superman syndrome. Because you take a rugged individualist too far, you take that, that entrepreneur energy, solopreneur energy too far, you become super person or superman or superwoman, where literally you take on way too much. You think you can accomplish way more in a day than most any three people can in a week. And you, you try to do it all yourself. And I can tell you from people that, you know, who have made a difference in this life, whether you're talking about, you know, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, or anybody else in the business world of the last, you know, X hundreds of years, they didn't do it all themselves, or they couldn't have made the impact that they made. Bill Gates didn't answer his own phone, for example, nor do I think that you should be doing that. People say, oh, well, I have an assistant to do that. Yeah, but there's other things you're doing and taking on possibly by yourself if you've taken on the super person syndrome. And it's literally, uh, again, not a moral discussion we're having, but the energy of that rugged individualist energy, the energy of taking on too much, of trying to do it all yourself, uh, and, and literally having becoming a human doing instead of a human being uh, can literally be blocking you from getting to where it is that you want to go. Because I contend that, you know, we as entrepreneurs, particularly as I believe 99% of the people on this call are chiropractors or chiropractic assistants, we've got really important work to do, right? And to try and, you know, take it on and do it all ourselves is really just not. So again, I've got, for those of you that feel like, yeah, he might be talking to me. We literally have a quiz that we offer our clients to find out if they're afflicted with super person syndrome. And I'm happy to share with you that quiz uh, if that's uh, something that you'd like to do, just to make sure you haven't taken the whole rugged individualist thing too far. Okay. So here's the benefits to systemizing your business and to getting that whole sort of rugged individualist, you know, against the world kind of energy out of your system. Number one, you increase the likelihood of making the most impact possible with your gifts and talents. And, you know, literally part of our worldview here at, at Full Circle, which is the name of our company, is that we feel that every person on the planet has uh, really distinct and unique and authentic things to do with their lives. For example, myself, I, I, some of the times I'm a father and some of the times I'm a son and a friend and a brother and a chiropractor and a coach and a business person and an athlete. And I mean, I've got lots of aspects to my authentic, you know, view, uh, the way my diamond shines, if you will, to use a, use a metaphor. But if I'm here to share my gifts with the world, which I highly contend all 7 billion of us on the planet are here to do, we want to make sure that we're making the most impact possible with our gifts. As I was talking to a client today from, from Washington State, it's like we have built in a desire to grow, to evolve, to change, to, to pursue, to you know, do things and make them bigger and better for our lives and for the people that we serve. That's innate to us. It's programmed within. And I contend that if you're going to make the most impact possible, the life you're given and the gifts you're given, because if you're in this profession, you've got gifts and you've got an opportunity to serve. And let's make sure that we maximize that ability by systemizing you know, your business. Number two, increase the ease and efficiency with which you get those results. And using just all of your personal charisma and energy, that's cool. I'm sure you've got lots. I'm sure you're quite bright or you wouldn't have got to this stage in your life. But that doesn't mean that you're not going to be 52 or 62 or 72 someday. And I promise all of you younger or younger at heart people watching this webinar tonight, 
uh, it does get a little bit harder to do the older you get. So if you want to make it the biggest impact you can with the gifts you've been given, structure the business, systemize the business, increase the ease and efficiency with which you get the results that you get. The third aspect is you'll also increase the longevity with which you might choose to work to get the results. Again, I just mentioned that. I can tell you from uh, being in this profession almost 30 years, it does wear on you a little bit or it can wear on you a little bit. I tell you, my worldview was not that, you know, almost 30 years ago. But now having lived those almost 30 years in this profession, I can tell you uh, it is a little bit tougher the older you get. So let's increase the longevity by making it easier on you so that we don't have this attrition rate that we have. It's so frightening to me to hear these great chiros in the peak of their careers, you know, 15, 18, 20, 25 years out, and they're, they're burning out. You know, they've just burnt themselves out. Um, I really think that's a, a, a sad situation, and it doesn't have to be that way if you can systemize your business even more. And the last one is to increase the likelihood that someone else can step into the role and continue to get the results. So you've got that peace of mind of being able to take time away, and you can also increase the likelihood that you can turn the business over to someone else when you're ready to retire. I contend that one of the greatest crimes in this profession is the lack of succession planning. The great business people will tell you that you should really be planning your exit strategy on day one in your practice, in your business. And most docs don't even think about it until they're burned out, bored out, and just, you know, ready to, to step out. And all of their great knowledge, all of their great wisdom, all of their great experience gets lost. And I don't mean to be critical because he's a mentor of mine, but I really believe in my worldview that B.J. Palmer was not great at succession planning. He passed on, you know, the torch to his son, Daniel David, and you know, if you think about the things that happened at the time, I mean, he took the epigrams off the walls, he closed the sanitarium, he closed the B.J. Palmer uh, clinic. I mean, there was a lot of changes, you know, due to a lack of succession planning. The more structured, the more systemized the business is, uh, the more likely you can, you know, pass the torch, pass the baton on to someone else and they can continue on your legacy. And if you share my belief that the work we're doing is very important work, then why wouldn't you want it to outlive you? Why wouldn't you want it to, to serve your community for hundreds and hundreds of years? Uh, to not do that, in my opinion, is actually a, a form of selfishness. The other issue here is while you're going through practice, uh, chiropractic economics tells us that your average chiropractor takes a week and a half off a year. When I talk to chiropractors, when I travel and speak around the world, they don't tell me that they want to take less time off. They tell me they want to take more time off, but they're terrified to do it. Well, if you've got structure and systems, it, you can increase the likelihood that that is going to happen. So again, if you get, you take nothing else out of tonight, and I hope you take a lot more of that. There is a lot of benefits to systemizing your business and getting that through your mind, getting that into your consciousness so that you have the desire and the why to do it so that the house start to look after themselves. All right, here's why systems work. Four issues here. They take emotion and discretion out of the equation, and I've got a story I want to tell you about that. They ensure that all of your clients have a similar, not necessarily identical, but a very similar experience. Um, and that actually leads to why you can walk 25 feet tall when someone leaves your practice, which I'll tell that story in a little bit. And they ensure that you and your team keep your energy constant and stay focused. Life is about energy, and energy has waveforms, like a sine wave, ups and downs. It's not like you're not going to have that, but if you can minimize the amplitude of those ups and downs, you're going to have more consistency. More consistently leads to more predictability of results, both in terms of the client care you give and in terms of the economic model that you work with. And the last one here, which is kind of a blend of those other three, is ensures that you don't let the human frailties of fear, uh, procrastination, rejection, and judgment slip into the equation and ruin the chance of helping someone see the value of your service or product for them and their family for the rest of their lives. And I learned this firsthand, folks. I'm not necessarily proud of what I'm going to share with you, but because it was a real uh, learning for me, I want to share it for you. Maybe you can learn osmotically. I used to do a lot of, uh, you know, speaking in my community, and that was one of the ways that I grew my practice, by just educating people to the value of what we did. And, uh, you know, we had a lot of different, you know, people come in from different walks of life in different places. We had a lady walk into her office, and, you know, I don't want to judge a book by its cover, but sadly this day I did. She was a tough-looking chick, you know. It looked like she was her late 20s, maybe early 30s. She had tats. She had piercings. She had, you know, biker clothes. I mean, she was a pretty rough-looking girl, and, you know, at the time we were offering people your care plans and I did an intake on her and she certainly was very subluxated. She certainly needed the care. And I wanted to offer her that your care plan the next day and report of findings. And, you know, the little critic in the back of my voice said, you know, why are you wasting your time? 
Uh, she's not your kind of client. She's not going to get it. She's not going to, you know, invest the, the dollars to get the year of care. It's thousands of dollars. You know, all of this blah, 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 human frailty noise in the back of my head. For whatever groups of reasons, I was wise enough in that moment to literally, you know, just, I said, just trust the system, work the system and, you know, let the chips fall where they may. So I laid out her, her challenges. I did a great report. I offered her the solution. I offered her options for care including the year care plan. And I said, so tell me, what do you want to do? Her next few words literally changed my life, you guys. And they literally cemented in why I believe so strongly in systems. She looked me right in the eyes and she said, who do I make the check out to for the year? I mean, I, you know, literally it was one of those, you hear it called the cliche all the time where you could have, you know, my jaw hit the floor, but literally in that example, I swear to God, it did. And I kind of mumbled out, you know, oh, Dr. Tom Preston, and la, 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 like that. And as she's writing out the check, she's kind of smirking. And she goes, you don't remember me, do you? And I said, I I'm really sorry. Have we met before? And she goes, yes. She said, you gave a talk almost three years ago at the YMCA Mums and Thoughts group. She says, I was so impressed by what you had to say and by you. And she said, by the work that I felt like I needed to have done. She said, I've been saving money out of my welfare checks for almost three years to be able to afford to come and see you. I gotta tell you something, folks. I had I had I had a tear in my eye at that moment there because I realized how judgmental I was and how I almost missed an opportunity to literally uh, help another person live a better quality life through the care I offered. Not only did she get under care, her boyfriend and her child got under care. And we served that family for many, many, many years. So I'll tell you this: when you take emotion and discretion out of the equation by systemizing your business, there's one of the great benefits. That story alone, folks, for me was worth the price of admission and all of the work we did to systemize our business, including developing structured table talk. All right, let's move on to point number two, how to ensure they get it. And that's something I hear all the time in the profession. Coach Tom, how do we make sure people get it? I don't know why they don't get it. I wish they would get it, right? And of course, you gotta understand what it is, but literally it was a question that I asked many years ago. I had the privilege of traveling to Australia with my family and we spent a couple of months uh, down under in Australia, New Zealand. We rented a beautiful motorhome, and if we liked where we were, we stayed, and if we didn't, we moved on. Well, this particular uh, slide I'm showing, Byron's Bay, Australia, was a, well, literally our favorite part of Australia. It's in the Gold Coast region on the Central East Coast, and we just loved it there. We stayed there for five or six days. Um, and if I had a pointer, I'd be you know happy to share with you. But if you can see, sort of, there's the beautiful beaches on both sides, but then there's this point. And the surfers used to go out, uh, and because there was good surf there around that point, and they would come out and, and you know ride the waves. And I was up on that, that bluff, literally reflecting, meditating one day. And I was reflecting on the concept of you know client education, patient education. And literally, I asked the same question that probably several of you have, which is, you know, why don't they get it? And you know, whether it was a hallucination I had or whether it was uh, you know the voice of the creator uh, herself or whatever, but I literally yelled out at the top of my lungs, why don't they get it? And what I heard back was, if they knew what you knew, Tom, they would do what you do. Well, I'll tell you something, folks, that was as real for me then, you know, literally 1992 as it is today, just reciting that. And what I realized was that education is absolutely the key to helping people get it, for helping people you know, know what I know, because if they knew what I knew, they would do what I do. I'm 100% convinced of that. So I felt then it like became not only a, a like a, a, a professional, but a moral and spiritual um, commitment that I made to help people know what I know. And I didn't need to send them off to university and study chiropractic at that level, but I could do as good a job as humanly possible at educating them. And so let me share with you three keys to education, all right? Number one, education be thought through and structured versus helter-skelter and chaotic. I have consulted in so many chiropractic offices where it is just... It's piecemeal, it's hit and miss, it happens, it doesn't happen. Uh, it, it's different for this person, it is for this person. There's no flow, there's no consistency. I contend that education starts the, the moment someone interacts with you, your team, or your website. And that education should never, ever end. And it should also build, as point number two here, education should be summative and build from their first contact as you continue all the way through their experience with you, okay? So in other words, what you perceive based on your philosophy, your technique, your worldview is uh, whatever you think the most important things are that they should be learning, that should start on first contact, certainly on uh, first visit, 
It should carry on through, you know, commonly what we call report of findings. She carry on through table talks. She carry on through your progress exams and reviews. She carry on through your doctor's report or, or healthcare uh, education class or whatever it is that you do. And it should be summative. One piece should naturally link to the next. And because in our information laden culture, people need to hear things 11 to 17 times before it even starts to sink in. You need to say it over again. You need to repeat the important part several times. And this is why Table Talk is such a great tool because it allows you, gives you a vehicle and a tool by which you can actually repeat the important concepts over again. When I hear people say, well, I told them once they should get it, I just want to slap them, right? It's like, are you kidding me, doc and staff? It's like, you, you, you know, team members, they're, they're so indoctrinated into a different worldview that you got to tell them at least seven to 11. Some people are actually saying up to 17 times before they even start to hear you. And I can only use myself as an example. My God, I, 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 you know, chiropractic is part of my life. I study it. I eat it. I breathe it. I drink it. I teach it. And I understand chiropractic better today than I did last year. Sure as hell better than I did five years ago. When I go back to the start of my career, I think I did such a terrible job. I should probably go find all those people and give them their friggin' money back. <laughs> So again, point number three, education should also never stop. And I want to share with you another story. It's what I call my Betty story. Betty was somebody who was in my practice for 14 years under regular wellness care. She came in every week to two weeks, commonly every two weeks, uh, in order to maintain an optimal level of efficiency of nurse system function. Long after on folks, right? I mean, at that point, after 14 years, I pretty much figured Betty understood what I understood because she was doing what I choose to do for me and my family, which is to get her on this care, which involves being checked for our family on a weekly basis. We don't always get adjusted, but at least we get checked to see if we have optimal nerve system function, right? Well, one Betty was elderly and one at one point she just she didn't come in one time. She missed her appointment for the first time in like 14 years. And the staff is concerned and maybe she'd fallen and couldn't get up or you know we didn't know what had happened. So our our systems kicked in to rebook her. And, uh, uh, you know, she didn't respond. She didn't reply. The team was getting more worried. And literally, there were obituaries for having Betty had passed. And so um, what, what happens after a period of time, if they didn't reactivate the person with a missed appointment, then they came back to me. So I called Betty. Betty was screening. But anyways, this day when I called her, she answered. I said, hey, Betty, it's Dr. Tom. She goes, hey, Dr. Tom, nice to hear from you. How are things? I said, oh, it's great. The family's well. I said, we've been worried about you. We missed your, you missed your appointment last week, and, and we're worried about you. She goes, oh, no, no, I'm fine. And I said, oh, my goodness, I'm glad you hear that. I'm glad you didn't fall and hurt yourself. So I said, I'm assuming you want to get that appointment rebooked, so uh, let me just you know put you on hold for a quick second. I'll put you up to the front. The girls can get that done. And I looked after for you, and she goes, no, 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 Dr. Tom. No, I, I said, I'm fine. I said, well, no, I'm happy to hear that, Betty, but I, you know, I'm sure you want to get your nerve system checked. And she goes, um, actually, you know what, Dr. Tom, I'm, I'm done with chiropractic. I, I said, I, I, I'm sorry. Like, I mean, literally, I was so confused. I said, well, I'm, I'm sorry, seriously, what, Betty, you're, you're, you're done? She goes, Dr. Tom, I love you. You're such a nice young man, and you've done so much to help me, and your staff is just great, but uh, I'm done with chiropractic, so thanks for calling. And she hung up the phone. You could have knocked me over with a feather, folks. I'm not just being cliche here. I mean, literally, you could have knocked me over with a feather after 14 years. And so I thought, you know, what, what, did, what did we do? And we didn't offend her. She loved us. So what did he do? I went back to her file, and I failed her. I had not done a progress review with her in three years. I made an assumption that Betty understood and got what I got. So point number three, education should never stop. And this is where Table Talk can play. Uh, again, another really key and important role. Let's move on. This is going to probably sound counterintuitive to many of you, but I want you to uh, figure out and learn how to feel good and walk 25 feet tall after a practice member leaves the practice. And this is my Ray story. I talked about it earlier. Ray was someone who came into my office, um, you know, on his terms, so to speak. Uh, he'd come in for a couple of months and get feeling better. His symptoms would go away. And, uh, you know, he would be gone for a couple of months and he'd be back and he'd be gone for a year and be back for six months and gone for eight months and back for three months. And just he was in and out of care over the course of many, many years. His wife, who was a nurse, was under regular care. His daughter was under regular care. But Ray just, for whatever reasons, you know, wasn't doing that. The sad thing is, is his neurological scans and his x-rays were both getting worse. I was literally watching this man deteriorate, become less healthy as the years were going by. and. Uh, you know, I don't know about you, but that bothered me. 
I can also tell you that when a client left my practice, I'd like to tell you that it didn't bother me, but it did. And every caring chiropractor I've ever talked to uh, tells me the same thing. I, I wish it didn't bug me, but it does. So every time Ray left, there's a little piece of me was kind of hurt a little bit because I knew that I wasn't getting through to him. Well, as the years went by, our systems got better and better and our education got better and better and better. And literally Ray came back in under care and uh, he said, you know what, Dr. Tom, uh, I tried it my way for all these years. Maybe we actually should try it your way. I said, Ray, I'd love the opportunity to educate you to the value of that. And we ran him through our protocols, our education systems, including Table Talk. And uh, literally, if we get through to the end of his, you know, our, our first 12, 15 visits with him, and of course, he was starting to feel better again, and we ran a, our, our protocols with him and did our, our progress review with him, did our table talk all the way through those visits, and we get to the re progress review, and I said, Ray, this is the story, This we're going to do it differently, we're going to do it my way, this is how we do it, this is what ongoing care looks like, here's the benefit to it, here's what I'm concerned about. We look at your degeneration and your x-rays getting worse. We look at your neurological scans getting worse. We see more and more health concerns showing up for you. I said, I really want you to consider doing it differently. And he looked at me in the eye and he says, you know what, Dr. Tom? I'm not sure I'm that guy. I'm really not. He said, I don't change the oil in my vehicle every 6,000 kilometers. I don't drink enough water. I probably should put more energy into my relationship with Colleen. But he said, you know what? So I just don't know if I'm that bad. But I'll tell you what, let me sleep on it. And let me get back to you tomorrow. I promise I'll call you tomorrow at your lunch hour. And I said, Ray, that's fine. You call me. Ray called the next day. And he says, you know what, Tom? I'm just not that guy. He said, I'll just be back when I'm symptomatic again. And I said, Ray, you know what? With great love and respect, I, I'm sorry. I can't do that anymore. I will definitely make a referral to another chiropractor who has a different you know, philosophy and view. But I can't watch you degenerate and deteriorate in front of my eyes. But thank you so much for coming in. Thanks for the trust it took to, you know, to get to this far. And uh, I can just appreciate the fact that you're just not that guy. You're not that guy that's going to you know, invest in his health long term. And so uh, it's been great. Thanks a bunch. And I hung the phone up. Well, I can tell you something, folks. Instead of being depressed and down that day, I walked 25 feet tall. And here's why. Because I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that it wasn't about me. <laughs> it had nothing to do with me. The last 25 people that worked through our education protocols uh, literally chose ongoing care. I mean, that was their choice right from the get-go, actually. But they literally were under care for you know an extended period of time and reaped the benefits of a properly functioning nervous system, you know, for the long term. It wasn't about me anymore. I guarantee you that the vast majority, if not all of you on this call, every time a practice member leaves your practice ahead of when they committed to, you blame yourself. And if you do not have good systems, good structure, particularly table talk in your practice, you may have a reason to actually be feeling tough about yourself. Wouldn't want you to do it long term, but in the short term, if you can use it as a motivator to get more structure, get more systems, change your mindset and continue to educate, then it will have been worth the little bit of stress and the little bit of self-flagellation you've given yourself. I do not live in that world. The vast majority of my clients don't live in that world. They see the value of ongoing education and they realize that some people are just different. They're not going to choose what you do despite knowing what you know. And uh, the difference, folks, is just being able to have that peace of mind to know that they're just, it's just, it's up to them. And you're not going to change their behavior at all, um, you know, in terms of the, the big picture of what it is and how they treat their lives. They don't treat their vehicles any better. They don't treat their relationships any better. They're certainly not going to treat themselves any better either. So uh, again, I want you all to be walking 25 feet tall. The price of admission is to get your head around the fact that you need to educate and systemize your business so that they can have those reliable, reproducible outcomes. And if people do choose to leave care, you know it's got nothing to do with you. It's the same education protocols you ran the last people through. Um, it's just, it's, a, it's all about them at that point. All right, so again, we want you walking 25 feet tall. All right, let's move on. I want you to realize the benefit of making education your practice a journey versus uh, a, a destination, okay? Um, because if you're not valuing education, then what's going to happen is you're going to go through those sine waves that I talked about earlier. I see this all the time when I consult around the world. People are like, you know, their numbers are a little down, and their new clients are a little bit down, their PVA is slipping, they don't feel like they're doing something, and all of a sudden they're all motivated by the crisis to, you know, to get out there, and they fire hose their clients, and they give them a bunch of stuff, and they go out and they buy a new website and they buy a new DVDs and they talk to the friends, what are you doing? Whatever they're doing, whatever pamphlets they've got. And they invest all this time and energy and money into, you know, getting things going. And for a little while, there's a destination based, you know, ways to, to you know, to do things. 
and there's a little bit of an upsurge in the education and then down the other side, you know, they go. And as I said earlier, folks, right, I strongly contend that we all have a really important mission to do with our lives. Purpose is defined in Webster's as the reason something exists or is done. There's a reason you exist. There's a reason why you do what you do. And there's a reason why my inspired plumber does what he does. The most inspired plumber I've ever met. I love this guy. I love how much he can talk about American standard toilet. <laughs> my accountant is as dry as friggin' Melba toast, but man, does that guy inspired by accounting. He's gotten so inspired, he literally lectures and teaches around the country to other accountants. That's the guy I want on my team. I want inspired individuals who are clear about who they are, are clear about what their purpose is, and have dedicated themselves uh, to the craft of being the best version of them that they can be. And I contend as uh, when each person does that, it's like this, this graphic, this slide you're seeing right now, it's like a chain. And if each one of us just does what we're put here to do and do it really, really well, then this whole little green and blue planet's gonna spin better and it's all going to work beautifully and interconnected through uh, the interconnected purposes. So I contend that you have a moral, a spiritual responsibility uh, as chiropractors or chiropractic assistants to do what you do really, really, really well. And you know, one of the ways to do that, as I said earlier, is to make education, your practice, a journey and not a destination. Here's what happens when you make it a journey. When you create an educational process and a system, you take the pressure off yourself to remember to educate. And, and so what happens, the outcome for you and your, and your practice members is you get increased reliability of results and you got that less of that self-critic in the back of your head, which anytime we can quiet that little critic, I'm, I'm always happy. Number two, practice members don't feel bombarded or fire hosed by a big dose of education, but benefit from being dripped education over time. As a result of that, they're more likely to stay, they're more likely to pay, and they're more likely to refer uh, their family and friends in. Number three, it keeps you and the team focused and on point all the time, which gives you more consistency of the great results that you get in practice instead of these ups and downs because you're not being present time conscious. I know that you know Walt Disney, who's a kind of a mentor of mine, in the old days when they used to do all the cartoons by hand, and he had these massive teams of artists, he found like when they were focused on a, on a, a very specific project and everybody was moving and working hard, their efficiency, effectiveness, and morale and joy went skyrocketing. But as soon as they got that project done, before they really sunk their teeth in the next one, there was this lull in efficiency and effectiveness. Morale was low. There's more sick days. People weren't as happy. It was just a, a lower focus time. So what he decided to do was to never end a project. Once this project had sort of reached the part where it was starting to slide a little bit, he would introduce a new project. And so the focus, the enjoyment in the work, the productivity and efficiency, you know, never ever dipped anymore at the Walt Disney Corporation. And the same is true for you. If you see your education starting on the first visit, working all the way through the entire journey of someone in the practice, then you're going to have more consistency of results and you're going to have better focus, better productivity for you and your staff, which equals better results for your patients, which is, I think, one of the keys. And the last piece I want to talk about here is practice members are more likely to be excited about the education because they realize there's always something new and exciting to learn because there is definitely a novelty factor, folks, in, in, in any business. And when people have been there, feel like they've been there, done that and paid for the T-shirt, they're less likely to be excited about coming back. And the downside is they may not get the full benefit of what's possible for them underneath your care. So again, it's about getting better results, people staying for the right reasons, and as a result, your PVA and your referrals also go up. So again, I definitely want to see you design a system of education that just keeps going on and on, and basically it never ends, even when someone's been under care for 14 years, like our Betty was. All right, now let's talk about the value of structured table talk, right, versus, you know, what we talked about, the sporadic stuff that, that so commonly, you know, happens, okay? Here's what I'm encouraging you to do, okay? So if you've got a, a, someone that likes to take notes, please take a note of this. I want you to think about the 10 most important concepts, ideas that you'd like to get across based upon your philosophy, your technique, your way of doing things, your worldview uh, with your clients. And I want you to think about the 10 or 12, whatever it is until your first you know, uh, continuing exam or your first progress review. I want you to literally think about the top 10 to 12, 15, whatever the number is, most important things that you would like people to understand about chiropractic, about health, about healing, and about your role in it, okay? And then I want you, once you've got that, let's just pick 12 as a number, just because that's a common place where people do their first PEs. Then what I'd like you to do is like you to think about the sequence or order with which you're gonna basically put that in, okay? Because the 
uh, order of operations with which you deliver information is actually really, really important, okay? Because if you're, um, you know, let me give you an example. If you've got two things to tell people and one's bad news and one's good news, if you tell them the good news before the bad news, it may have a completely different outcome than if you give them the bad news before the good news, okay? It's the same information net net, but the sequence with which it's delivered can make a big impact on how people perceive it. So again, I, I really want you to think through and put a structure to what's the most important thing. If this person's only gonna be here for one visit past the report, what's the most important thing I want them to remember about chiropractic? Whether it's you know the power that made the body heals the body, or you're giving them some reference place about the speed with which the nerve system works, or you're giving them the uh, you know only 10% or less of the nerve system, depends who you read, uh, literally is designed to perceive pain and no susceptive C fibers. So if you're judging how healthy your nerve system is and therefore your life and your, your, your overall health by how you feel, you know, you're doing a crappy job. You're not, you're not only using 10% of the system that's available to you. So, you know, I'm just throwing out a few ideas and I've got literally hundreds of these ideas uh, that we share with our clients, but uh, I'm sure most of you have no shortage of at least 12 ideas. So put them in the right sequence and then literally I want you to uh, build one part of, of, uh, upon the other, as I, I said earlier, and then I want you to role play them and, and talk about them and think about them. I want you to come up with at least four different ways to say the same thing from a slightly different perspectives based upon who you're talking to. Whether you're talking to someone older or younger, whether you're talking to an athlete or a business person, whether you're talking to a mom or a dad, I want you to literally be able to get your brain out of the way, get your head out of the way, and be able to be in a place where you can just connect with the human being in front of you and innately just express it in the way that's going to serve them the best. That's the value of having it structured um, and to basically, re, you know, review it. Years ago, when I was still in chiropractic college, I had the privilege of working for a company called um, PepsiCo Foods. I worked for their fruit a division. I had a really sexy title. Uh, I was the assistant sales merchandising manager of frito Lake Canada. Big, sexy title. Basically, I was Joe Friday for some of the senior executives is what my role was. But I can tell you something. When they were doing a product launch, when those, when those managers of those divisions, the VP of marketing or sales was going to do a new product launch, man, they would lock themselves in that boardroom. And for days and days and days, they would practice and rehearse that little, you know, 15, 20, 30 minute, whatever it was, you know, presentation that they're giving to the sales force or to senior execs or whatever it was. And they would work that. And that's really becoming a master at your craft. It's, it's carrying enough of what you're doing. You know, to go out there, to use a hockey analogy and, you know, and take shots for hours and hours, you know, on, on end. So don't think because you've been in practice for three years or 33 years that your commitment to your craft should ever end. In fact, I think practicing and getting better and better and better at your educational opportunities, as well as you know, how you deliver the service through your technique is something that's just really, really, really wise and separates the good ones from the great ones. All right, let's talk about how to take an educational opportunity and turn it into a referral moments so your practice members are excited to refer. Because there's basically two reasons to do table talk, folks, okay? Number one, most important, is to educate them, right? But number two is to also get referrals out of this, right? So it's really easy to do that when you know your practice members and you're putting an intention for it. I always teach my clients to have uh, at least two people, target two people per shift, that you're going to you know, do a what we call a referral request during table talk for, okay? And it might go you know, something like this. And, and who you pick is really important. And you wanna brainstorm this with your team so that you're you know, picking somebody that's really in, a, in that, that energy, that space, where you feel like they're getting the results that they wanna get, they're getting the kind of experience they wanna get, they're getting the kind of customer service they wanna get. And uh, you know, if you've been in practice for a while, you know that there's just windows of time where people are more open to you know, making the referral than others. And you want to basically intuit or with your experience know that and then find at least two people per shift that you want to enroll or educate in the possibility of making a referral, friend, family member, or coworker, right? And, you know, for me, it might go something like this, right? Um, Bob, I'm so pleased with your results and I, and I know you're pleased as well. Of course, you're in di didactic conversations, so you're getting some feedback from them, you know? And Bob, you know what? I, uh, I have a commitment, our office, we have a commitment to helping um, the most people possible to live uh, the most extraordinary, healthy lives humanly possible. And I'm going to bet there's people that you know that I don't know. And so I want you to think right now, Bob, of one person that you wish, now you can insert different lines here, folks, that you wish for getting the results that you're getting, that you wish understood what you understand about the value of a properly healthy functioning nervous system, 
uh, that you wish you didn't have to live with the chronic migraine headaches you lived with for 35 years, or, or again, you can insert whatever it is that fits for you in there. But as a, you know, what you're basically doing is you're offering them the possibility to think of one person, only one person that they know that they wish understood what they understand or they're getting the results that you were going to get. And at that point, you want to literally shut up and listen and just give them time to think because, you know, your average person has about 7,000 people in the Rolodex of their mind. So the key distinction here is don't ask them for somebody they know or they're going to have to run through all 7,000. Ask them for one person they know, all right? Once you get that name, and of course, there is a way to help support them if they're having trouble struggling for a name. Uh, you know, you ask them, say, well, you really, you don't have any coworkers that you wish were healthier. You don't have any family members you wish were healthier or didn't suffer with or whatever it is, right? Um, and so at that point, now, once you've got a name, then you can say, so, you know what, Bob, uh, I'm convinced that you can't, you know, you can take a horse to walk, but you can't make a drink. So I don't want to try and convince people of anything. But what I'd like to do is educate, in this example, your sister, Laura, um, to understand what you understand. And so there's lots of ways we've been successful doing that, right? Um, we could have her come in with you during an adjustment sometime, book some extra time. I could, you know, have a conversation with you. She could see what we do. Uh, of course, we do that class that you attended, Bob, every Wednesday night at six o'clock. Be happy to invite her to that. Uh, we also have uh, some really great uh, information on her website that she could just go and peruse at her own time. You know, what do you think is the best choice, Bob, for your sister, Laura? And then again, just shut up and let Bob think. I'm using this example, right? And let him think about what the example is, which is going to be the best way. I highly recommend you have a large a table of ideas that you want to present to them, but you never, ever present more than three ideas, okay? So with a little experience, with a little intuition, you can come up with the three that you think will best serve. If they say none of those are going to work, well, then give them a couple of more. But don't overwhelm them and fire hose them with ideas up front. Give them some examples of what you think would serve you know, them or their family member in this example best, and then you know, wait for them to make the choice. Once they've made the choice, I think it's wise to actually take those that 30 seconds, walk with them right up to the front, go up to your front desk manager or office assistant and say, you know what, Sharon? Um, Bob's sister, Laura, uh, is somebody that we'd love to educate about the value of having a properly functioning nervous system. And so Bob's going to bring her in on his next adjustment, talk to her about coming in his next adjustment. So I want to be sure that you uh, book us some extra time so that we can do that. Okay. What then your desk staff or office manager would do, they would record it either in your, your office software or literally, you know, in just an old fashioned, you know, written form uh, that literally we call your master lead generation sheet. Where literally you got a chance to follow up this person and to ask Bob next time he's in, you know, about Laura, if, if Laura didn't come in. Um, and I always wrote in the old days before we had, you know, paperless offices, uh, we would, you know, write it literally right on their travel card and red pen, you know, Laura uh, coming in with Bob next visit so that we didn't forget. Because the only thing that's worse, folks, than not asking for referrals and helping humanity be a healthier, more vibrant place is to ask for referrals and not care enough to follow up. That is terrible customer service all it does is tell them that you don't care about them and that all you were doing was trying to find a way to make your next you know mercedes-benz payment or something right so if you truly care about your pack your practice members which i'm sure you do then be sure that you have a way and a master lead generation sheet is a way to basically you know follow up okay so again here's some ideas for education you know your website you got audio products you got video products you made have pamphlets you've got your class that you teach and you know i commonly would call people with permission, you know, at home. There's lots of different ideas. Make sure you're, you and your team brainstorm a smorgasbord of ideas. And then again, three is usually by rule of thumb in any given, you know, table talk experience when you're asking someone for a referral, okay? The last part I wanna really go over here, folks, is learning how to ensure you never forget to use table talk to educate again. As I said, when I consult and coach, I commonly run into people that are just all the time saying, yeah, I used to do table talk and then I got away from it. And, well, you know, why is it that we get away from things that are so good, for, you know, for us? I've talked to people in the relationship world. So, yeah, my wife and I used to go on date nights, but, you know, I don't know. Something changed and we just don't do it anymore. And it's like if it was a great idea and served your values, why would you ever stop doing it? And the key to this, folks, is to make it rhythmic, to make it systematic. Okay. So, again, one of the ways to do this in, in you know, paperless offices is to just literally have on every visit three, um, you're going to have a buzzword that pops up. So if the thing you wanted him to, to remember is that only 10% of their nervous system actually, you know, feels or perceives pain, then maybe the active word or the buzzword or the mnemonic word that's going to jump off the page on visit every visit three is going to be 10%. And that would be the thing that would trigger you to remember that that was the piece you're going to talk about that day. Let's be clear. 
you, that may not be the only thing you talk about that day, but amongst whatever else you're going to talk about the day, you're certainly going to talk to every client on visit three about using this example, you know, only 10% of the nervous system feels or perceives pain. So it's a poor indicator of how healthy their nervous system is and therefore how healthy their life or their, their bodies are. Okay. Uh, again, if you're not into paperless office, which is fine, then literally just take your travel cards and just write on, you know, visit three and red pen, get your, you know, a colored pen so it jumps off the page, get your team to write in, you know, whatever those buzzwords are for that first 12. Okay. Until your first PE. Once you've got that, you've got it structured, you've got it systemized. I want you to then go into your next 12 or whatever your next, you know, progress review is. And then do your next 12 and do your next 12. And literally, I remember one of my clients years ago um, just took this idea and ran with it. And within weeks, he had his first 55 visits preset and pre-written into his travel cards. Think about the unconscious statement he's making to the universe. He's putting out the intention by the law of attraction that everybody who comes into his office is going to be in his office for at least 55 visits. Now, that may not be over the course of a year. That might be, of course, over 20 years or whatever. I mean, let's not get into somebody, you know, turning their minds off from the value of our, our conversation tonight because they're thinking that somebody's overutilizing. It's just that the mindset of it is something that is really important to get. And I hope all of you get some of that, um, you know, tonight as a result of our time together. All right. Well, let's bring this thing in for a close. If you want to find out if you have super person, Superman syndrome, so that you stop taking on too much. You can delegate the unimportant and inspired tasks and live a more authentic lifestyle and literally make a bigger impact with the great gifts you've been given as a, as a chiropractor, chiropractic assistant. Then I'm going to encourage you to just email admin at drtompreston.com uh, and we'll be happy to send you a copy of the questionnaire. Um, once you've done the questionnaire, if you'd like to literally do some follow up on that and get some strategies for how to uh, you know, take the kryptonite, so to speak, so that you don't have super person syndrome anymore then literally you can book a complimentary authenticity call with me free of charge, uh, my gift to you. Uh, if you're someone that just isn't interested in superperson syndrome, but you'd just love to, uh, you know, pick my ear for 20, 30 minutes about uh, something that's important to you in your life, your practice that you're stuck on. Um, and at this point, you don't have a coach or you don't see the value of investing in some coaching. Uh, we believe in the concept of reciprocity. We believe that the more you give, the more you get. Uh, the more that we help other people, the more eventually we're going to be helped. So if you'd like to book a complimentary authenticity coaching call to, you know, pick my brain or one of my uh, uh, associate coaches, happy to do that. Just go to, you know, www.drtompreston.com forward slash call, and uh, you'll get the opportunity to look for some opportunities and some uh, uh, ways to, to do that. Uh, again, I highly encourage you, if you resonate with the concept of being a rugged individualist, that you actually do do that super person uh, questionnaire that we made up many years ago. It literally is an eye opener for me. It's a graded scale and you can see sort of how much kryptonite it might take to get you to uh, 